Oh my god. 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 Um, and that's when they're gonna give me budget to buy more. <laughs> I mean, I'll approve that. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, people. This is Coded Life. This is the How to Human Show. These are your hosts, Sam, Jeff, and Nicole. Hello, everyone. With us, we have our special guest, Nate. How are you, sir? I'm good. Why don't you introduce yourselves really quick? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm Nate Taylor. Um, I'm in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, um, and uh, lifelong Midwesterner. Um, been doing software and software-related things for uh, twenty some years now, twenty twenty-three almost, I guess. Uh, the last couple as a as a people leader. Um, after about twenty years of writing code, uh, step uh, stepped away from the keyboard, uh, and and now just am on Zoom cameras uh, uh, instead of writing code. So. Um, in addition to that, I guess I've uh, I've spoken at conferences, including one that I guess gets mentioned here from time to time, uh, of KCDC. Uh, I have my own conference that I run now uh, that Sam's going to be speaking at next month, uh, and I have I'm the author of I don't know 17 or so Pluralsight courses. So that's kind of me. Oh. I want to point out, Nicole, I did not mention KCDC this time, right? It was still brought up. We'll find a way for it to be mentioned on every show. You I mean, get literally. Solved. I'm literally in K in Kansas City right now at the hotel because I have meetings for KCDC like all afternoon. So there you go. Post I, I just here. Too. I'll show the KCDC Sam post post connect to link. I'm doing it. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> and just to be clear, we're talking about the ACDC cover band KCDC, correct? Correct. Yes. Yes. The, yeah. It was just like ACDC only with a K. Yeah. Who yes. made who? Ooh. Right. For those who like the code, we salute you. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so these are two great, great Heartland uh, conferences. Um, so that's Connect Aha, that's in Omaha, and Nebraska, where Nate is. Excited to head down there in April, and then KCDC comes up in June. Is, the, uh, <laughs> is the shirt Nate uh, trying to impress Jeff here? Uh, no, I city. don't try to impress Jeff. Um, <laughs> no, it is. We, we just hug him. He, try, he tries, he tries, and goes out of his way to unimpress me whenever I, possible. That is very true. That's very true. <laughs> I was, I spent more time than I should admit trying to find a way to see if I could verbally commit grammar mistakes instead of just in writing. Um, and I was unable; my head couldn't wrap my wrap around there because I was thinking like even Oxford commas, you would just insert the comma if I was speaking. Um, so things like that are, are hard to do in person. I type. T E H instead of the all the time. So I should just start saying, like, let's go to Ta <laughs> Buffet. Like, <laughs> it's time for t -t 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 dinner. Um, I, right. If, if you enjoy grammar humor, you should follow Tay. Um, you should follow. I, I, I want to say like Tay Lonner. That works. Um, it's like not really. Well, because I always want to put Taylor N, but it's not. Right. It's like, no. It's like almost your last name and then like your first two initials. So, you so here's the mm -hmm. here's the story. When I when I graduated, I went to work at Caterpillar and, and in their Active Directory equivalent, it was the first five letters of your last name, your first initial, your middle initial. And it just happens that my middle initial is also the sixth letter of my last name. Um, and so it looks like they are transposed. Um, and so that was my my login for whatever, four, four to six years, whatever, however long I was there. Um, but then when I when I left and I needed to set up social media accounts, you find out that um, unlike Jeff Strauss, uh, Nate Taylor is a rather common name. And so I have to come uh, creative uh, with my my social media things. You'd be surprised. There is a Jeff Strauss who was an executive producer on Friends in Chicago Hope. And there was a Jeff Strauss who was like some sort of celebrity chef in LA. So it was actually kind of an issue. For, I, you wouldn't have thought that. Um, uh, there was a there was a Nate Taylor that dated some famous actress. I can't remember. She, he was a DJ, um, and someone at work was like, like they came in one day and they're like, I don't, I didn't know that you dated, you know, whoever Jennifer Lawrence or something like that, you know. And I was like, no, it's a, it's a different. How do we know that's Nate not our, our Jeff? Might have right. Been, been so, our so, Jeff. Uh, so if you follow Taylor Lanner and uh, you follow me, and you want to enjoy seeing somebody poke the bear. You would really have a great time watching Nate try to poke the bear with me with grammar problems that he sees online that make me like have tremors. It's really, it's really great. 
Um, so Nate, well, now I know what I'm going to tweet at you, Jeff. If, now you I know. Tweet, if you tweet bad grammar at me, like I, yes, that is a quick way. <laughs> okay, to, now we know yes, how to. You know, that is what happens you. when. Uh, yeah. So so Nate, so, we we wanted you to come on, right? Because um, when did you first talk about this story with me? It was like a, it was probably pre-COVID when you. It was were definitely pre-COVID. To, yeah, when you were starting to think about this this keynote you wanted to write, and you, were, and you go that you eventually gave it Faith Leads Tech and maybe a couple other places about um, the story. I don't know how much you want to talk about this on the show, but like the stuff with, yeah. you, with your mom and the and, and like how it kind of got you to think about um, the difference we really make with technology and like it does a lot for if you if you kind of hear Nate's story, which hopefully you can share a bit of here. I think it causes people it certainly made me think differently about the work that we do day to day and help with things like morale, <clears throat> helps with things when it's like, man, it's just another grind. We're just doing the same thing over and over. But a lot of times people don't get to really think about the difference that the work we do every day makes in ways that you never even see and never even know. <clears throat> so I don't know if you want to yeah. share a bit. Yeah, it, it, I'm thinking, um, I'm trying to think, I think it was 2018 was Faith Leads Tech and I'd given the talk a couple times before that. So probably 2017 was, maybe 2016 was when I you and I talked about it. Um, actually, the first person That's I talked so to it, yeah, uh, it was definitely pre-COVID because I haven't spoken since COVID. Uh, um, like I'm breaking my silence today. Uh, it's the first time I've opened my mouth in three and a half years. Um, the first person I talked with actually was Art Doler. Uh, it was at a Qdoba mm -hmm. in Des Moines because we were there for Prairie Code and we'd gone out to eat. Um, uh, as a side note, since I have celiac, I often don't eat at conferences and then I just go find uh, the safe places. And Art's like, yeah, I'm, I'm up for leaving campus. Uh, and I told them, I was like, hey, I've got this idea for a talk. I was like, I don't know where it's going to go, uh, but I know the first line. And he kind of looked at me. And so I said, uh, the first line of the talk, how I would open it is, um, I remember vividly the last conversation I had with my mom, but for the life of me, I can't remember the last words she spoke to me. Uh, and he kind of sat back and he was like, you need to tell me more. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I, I have a talk here, right? Like that was like, there's something here if, uh, if I can get another speaker to be like, yeah, tell me more about that. Um, and so it's, it's deliberately kind of, you know, tried to be catchy a little bit there to just go, wait a minute, how does that work? Um, and how it works is that in 2008, uh, my mom was uh, diagnosed with ALS and, and passed away in 2009, uh, after pretty much a, a typical 18 month battle uh, with ALS. Um, uh, she lost her ability to speak pretty early on. Um, and so she would type out messages. Um, and then she lost her ability to move her fingers in a way that could write or type out. Uh, and so the last conversation we had was uh, literally the day before she passed away. And she had this computer kind of on a, almost like a tripod. It was a really thick, like four inch uh, tablet, um, but it would track her eyes. And so she could move, um, she had enough control of her arm to move her wheelchair over there. And she could, ha you know, move her eyes across the keyboard and then blink or hold her eyes closed for a second or two. And then it would type out. And so she uh, had typed out some instructions for, um, my sister and I with the funeral and some things like that. And, um, and so that was the last time. And then, and then I guess too, I should say, finally she could hit a play button. So it was still spoken. It just wasn't her voice, right? It was a 2009 computer voice it sounded very much like speak and speak and say, um, so, or speak and spell. Um, and so that was the last time, you know, that I had that conversation with her, but it was probably 18 months to two years before was the last time she actually spoke to me. Um, and uh, so that, that I started thinking about that and and just like what all went into that um, to facilitate that conversation. And just on the computer, I mean, there's the obvious ones, right? Like you have this software that lets you track your eyes and type things out. And um, I think that's something that all of us, if given the opportunity, well, not all of us, most of us have given the opportunity would be like, yeah, I'd love to work on that. That's That's changing people's lives, right? Like, how could you not want to do that? And, and as I thought about it more, I realized, well, there's a whole lot more that goes into it, right? Like somebody from Microsoft, because it was a Windows-based computer, wrote a driver for a video card probably 10 or 15 years before, right? And it had been updated over time and, and new changes and stuff like that with no thought at all of like, hey, one of these days, this guy in Green Valley, Missouri is going to have the last conversation with his mom because I'm writing a video card uh, driver or I'm writing a mouse driver or I, I'm the one that fine-tuned the web camera focus code, Right. Like all of that stuff. And you start thinking about it. And I was like, oh man, there were a lot of people that probably didn't even realize the lives they were changing. Um, obviously, not obviously, but probably the last person figured it out. Like, yeah, look, we're changing lives. We're letting voiceless people speak. Um, but everyone before that with operating system engineers and driver engineers and hardware engineers, like all of that went into 
to changing a life. Um, and so, um, when I, when I remind myself of that, uh, then yeah, it's easier to, to go into work on the hard days. Uh, cause you know, on the days you think you're not making the change, you're like, well, you don't, you don't actually know where this is going to wind up in someone else's hands. Right. So that's, that was kind of the gist of the talk and, and we can go into more, uh, ways. I, I, I took it from that and realized that <clears throat> most of us aren't going to be, I, I am unskilled to write a driver. Like I'll just admit that I, maybe web apps, but drivers are probably outside of my, my ability. Um, but there's other ways to make changes, you know, even with how you handle PRs and, uh, you know, things like that. So that's kind of the, the gist of, of the talk that was the, or that was the elevator pitch. I think that I gave to Jeff that finally got me into like KCDC to speak there on that one. I feel like that happens with science too. You know, people start noodling around with like little things in science and then they, they build and people use others work and leverage kind of the, the bones that came before, like somebody makes the cells, somebody makes the, you know, everything build, build, build until you end up with a person. Forgive me for not knowing the exact steps up, up and up and up, but I've got, you know, I've got a skeleton. So I know that he comes before the skin, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, a year, a few years ago, we were driving, my, my family and I were driving somewhere and we stopped at the stop sign and to the right were um, earth moving equipment and they had these balls on the top of them. Um, and this was like 2019, maybe. And and I said, hey, you guys, you guys see that? And they're like, yeah. I was like, do you know what that is? Right? No. And I was like, that that's like, those aren't quite self-driving, but it helps them position and all this kind of stuff. And I said, 19 years ago, when I was at Caterpillar, we were testing out self-driving mining equipment. I wasn't, but Caterpillar was. And I was like, so you all are hearing, you know, my kids were uh, four years ago. So like 15 and 17. I was like, you are all hearing about Tesla self-driving, which is really cool. And you think it just got invented. And this big yellow equipment company, uh, they were working on that 20 some years ago, right? And it was just like, like you said, they, they did something and then someone else did something and then someone else did something. And then now we're like, oh yeah, maybe our cars can be self-driving. I mean, that's certainly, I think the nature of software in general, especially also making bodies, human bodies, Nicole, but, um, but it's <clears throat> the nature there's, of, there's body, like, there's a you know, software, biological thing. You've got fake arms and fake legs. Like we got, yeah, we got it. That's true. I mean, that's, actually, you know, that's another actually really interesting example, probably, right? Imagine all the stuff that has to go into like, like years of research and little tiny bits of electronic components, software components for things like prosthetics. That's actually a great example. Um, but the, you know, software in general is definitely built on top of something else. I, I have conversations a lot about open source, right? And companies are like, oh, you don't use open source software here. It's like, nah, you, you do. Like, you definitely do. There's, there's no chance at this point that you don't. Like, and you definitely use work that other people have created. Like, you're not writing everything from scratch. And that's just the, I mean, we'd be crazy if we wrote everything from scratch. And so the nature of what we do every day anyway is, is writing, you know, whatever our application is, it's the last mile after you know many 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 miles traveled of all the other components that that allowed us to do it that fit together just right and i think you're right Nate. even even when it's not changing lives in the way that it did for you like you just never know like the things that you're writing you have no idea how they're going to be used which is both exciting and terrifying at the same time um in ways right so do you i mean how often do you find that you use that i mean we've talked about it and i know we talk about it at like conferences and events and things but like how much of that gets used and how much of that do you use that story and things like it just in a workplace? I, do you talk about this with your teams and your people? Like, I, I have. Um, I mean, one of the things, so I have a, a personal readme that I share out uh, with everyone that joins my team or anytime I take on a new team. And it's it's like a project readme, but it's for me. So it's kind of like, here's how I think and operate. And one of the things I say in there is that I tell a lot of stories and that coworkers have told me I repeat myself. So I only have a few stories. Uh, and so this one makes the rotation, you know, not, not as much as the others, um, but it does. Actually, it, it came up this week, um, but that could have been because I knew I was coming on today to talk about this. So I don't, I don't know how much of that was just forefront of mind. But one of my, one of my engineers was talking about, he had played with this, um, uh, he played with a webcam, uh, thing that tracked your eyes and he was trying to build a, a connect Four game by just moving his eyes. And so he was talking about the struggles he had with that. And then I was like, Oh yeah, look, let me tell you about this other thing that you can do with uh, tracking your eyes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'll share it from time to time or, or little bits and pieces of, of maybe not that story, but just kind of the, like, here's the human side of, of software. Uh, and 
Um, I, towards the end of uh, of the talk, uh, the, the latter third of the talk or so, I, I really get into more of the like, there's the software part of that, right? Like you just said, open source libraries or whatever that you don't even know that you're using and they're impacting you uh, to where I actually recognize a, a co one of my first coworkers um, who no one has ever heard of before, uh, a man named Roger Odom uh, from Central Illinois, who did an amazing code review with me. And because of how well he did that code review, it influenced my code reviews. And I've had people tell me, I like your comments on PRs and not this person's comments on PRs. Um, and a, lot, a large part of that was the first thing Roger said when he sat down with me, at, you know, I mean, he had, this is the day he printed out code. So there was red ink everywhere. But the first thing he said was, I assume the code works because you're a pretty smart person. Like you wouldn't have asked us to review code that's broken, but you're not following the patterns that we have that will make it sustainable in the future. So let's go through those. And it wasn't, you're an idiot. Why didn't, why did you mix view and controller logic? It was, you didn't know, let's go through this. Right. Uh, and that, that shaped my career. Uh, and, and so as I was working on this talk, actually, I, I connected with him on LinkedIn uh, and reached back out to him uh, to see if he even remembered. And he did. Um, but he was like, yeah, most people aren't uh, as a big of a fan of my code reviews as, as apparently I was. But I, I think of that from time to time, too, right? Just that, like, um, I can go in and, and well, I don't PR anymore. But if I did, um, I should clarify, I'm a leader of people, so I don't I don't get in code. It's not that I, my code's so good, I don't PR. But I don't review people's code anymore. But if I did, I don't go in and be like, wrong, 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 change this, do this. Instead, I try to, like, give an example. Like, hey, I think this would be more clear. Or... Um, even comment positive things like, oh, I didn't know you could do that, right? Those kind of things make a difference and it changes how people show up to work. Uh, and if you're not pissed off at work, you probably write better code. That's my my hypothesis. I've, I've just recently started writing HTML. Yes, I know, I'm, I'm like 40 and I just started writing HTML, but I wish someone would review my code because I'm just like, I'm gonna look at this website and I'm gonna copy paste and I'm gonna try and sit here and just look with Visual Studio and say, does this work? Does this work? So, you know, I'd love it if somebody reviewed my stuff to be like, you could do this much easier than you're doing it. <laughs> Sounds like Nate knows a guy. Um, and you know what? The, I'm the on this call, in fact. Yeah, you, you know what? Um, I suspect that more people, they may not outwardly realize that they like his code. When he says things like, oh, apparently most people, most people aren't fans of my code reviews the way you are, Nate. They probably, I bet they still, even if they feel pitch at the time, they still learn a lot from it and go forward yeah. and they tweak what they do because it was effective, right? Right. Um, I hadn't really thought about that because I don't think I've had that conversation with you before, this bit about, you know, I think a lot now, because I think about it all the time, about the, the conversations we've had about the stuff with your mom and about the the little things and the driver that impacts this, that creates this, that makes this wonderful thing that like made made something really important happen for you. But I haven't really thought about the process side of it, just the way you talk to people and the way that that sort of um, spreads through a community, spreads through an industry just by, by treating people the right way and showing them a better way to learn and improve, um, which makes me rethink about just about everything I do. So, so thanks. For so let me, let me ask you all this is, uh, have you, have you ever worked with uh, a boss or a leader um, that every every time you asked a question turned into a game of 20 questions? You mean when they, they start being like, what, what's it called? A sophomoric or some or Socratic? And they just start like asking you questions to lead to your own answer? Because I hate that. I, that might be part of it. I guess I was thinking of a slightly different approach um, where like I had a, a, a boss once uh, or a team lead. I don't know what they were, um, but they, you know, I'd ask a question and their answer would be no. Oh, okay. Um, you know, so something like, I assume that we don't want to let guests check out. And the answer would be no. And you're like, no, we don't or no, my assumptions wrong. Your assumptions wrong. We do want to let guests check out. Yes. I'm like, okay, why couldn't you have just, you know, like, why am I playing this game of like, yes, no answers until I get to the question you really wanted me to ask. Uh, where, you have to, where you, the questioner, has to play the 20 questions game yeah. and tease things out. <clears throat> I doubt that's that, what it's talking to me because once you say something to me, I just start talking and I never shut up. Yeah, um, yeah it's not a problem for you. Um, <clears throat> no, it's not. It's not so, no. I have a few questions here, Nate. Uh, and <laughs> I'm, I'm not smart enough like the other three of you to you know, uh, help manage people. My head is still very much in code. Uh, but when, when you talked about that, and uh, you know, sorry about you know, your loss uh, with your mom, but that that is a good story of you know how 
you know, software helped you connect. Uh, so you, you said, you know, there were drivers, there were devices that would, you know, track eyeballs and mm-hmm. would let her, you know, type. So h- how much of this would you say was, you know, custom designed for, you know, uh, that type of situation versus what just crosses over into, you know, accessibility and just thinking about how your devices, your software can be used by, you know, differently able people. Yeah. No, it's a great question. Um, I, I think with it being in 2009, um, accessibility wasn't a thing then. It, it, it was, right? Much, yeah. But for us in the software community, um, kind of like for me in Omaha, UX wasn't a thing until around 2012. UI design was a thing, but user experience wasn't a thing until 2012. Like we just, as a community, didn't grow to that point. And I think accessibility was kind of like that. So I think this was probably very custom built. Um, mm-hmm. But I think today there's a lot more overlap with that as, as people start to understand that you don't have to be uh, voiceless and paralyzed in your hands for this to be advantageous, right? Um, there's there's other situations where um, low visibility or different um, different levels of visibility would still benefit from an accessible application. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was probably just a combination of things that they were like, hey, we're, the final step was very focused and everything before was probably not as much uh, focused on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you got to appreciate the you know um, that all of us now recognize accessibility is not just you know a luxury. It, it's a you know business need for you to you know have a you know broader reach. And I uh, I posted this thing that uh, Xbox uh, team makes like they have a controller that is so nice. Uh, I forget what exactly it's called, but it can work with you know any part of your body that you can tap into and mm. it, can, it can track. So uh, a lot more things can be you know accessible to a lot more people if we just put a little bit of thought and not just keep it as an you know afterthought uh, once you have built it for everybody now you just you know strap on a few accessibility features yeah. it's interesting because yeah. i'm i'm seeing people use um things that might have been tailored for accessibility reasons for people with disabilities but they're kind of taking advantage of them themselves anyway like screen readers um, you know, I know a lot of people who will put on screen readers if they're reading articles or something online because they just prefer to hear it than to than to put eyeballs on it. And I just I find that so interesting is that, you know, even when we're developing with, you know, trying to change lives of people who, who need software, that that people who may not need it may still want it. So it might have a broader applicability than we think of in the first place. Um, yeah. once, it's, once it's built, you know. It, and also, so we had um, in the virtual version of Connect All, which I think was 21, um, uh, we had a, a, a speaker from Google um, and he talked a lot about like inclusive design and designing for everyone. And one of the things he pointed out was that, um, that the language wouldn't have been used then, but the remote control for your TV was an accessibility device initially, right? And now think about how many of us couldn't live without a remote control or, you know, in our case, like my case, it's on my phone um, and I can just control my TV with my phone. But like that was a thing that was like, yeah, it's hard for people to stand up, walk across the room and turn the dial um, for for those of us of an old enough age to remember that. But now everyone has to you can't I, I literally are we broke our remote for one TV. We couldn't use the TV until I went and bought another remote. Like it, there was no buttons on it. There was a power button. and That was it. Uh, and so now it's like, oh, well, yeah, this thing that was designed for accessibility, again, they probably wouldn't use that term back then, is now something that everyone loves. And so it's it was a good reminder, too, of like um, how much those improvements make. Like, I'm grateful that there's a remote control. <laughs> like it's, it's, we just need to plan for people to be lazy. Like yeah. anything we can do to like replace physical <laughs> effort is like uh, like the way to go. We're all going to be like Wally. Did you see? No, Wally? I, I was just thinking Wally. As soon as you said that, I was like, let's not go down that path because I was literally I was about to say that I was picturing the people in Wally in their little pods floating around, like unable to reach the drink, like on their little tray. So, so something that um, man, something that that Sam and Nicole, both of you, kind of touched on that I've been sitting here thinking about ever since something Nate said earlier. I think it would be an interesting exercise with a team. Um, Nate, you talked about your colleague who's like, oh, I was playing with this thing with, with eye tracking. You're like, well, let me tell you another way that can be used. You know, it would be kind of interesting every once in a while to work at, at I think it would be good for helping productivity, helping ideation, helping, um, you know, future, future, you know, looking ahead, I, I don't know, is when you're planning a new 
component or a new feature or just a new piece of tech that you're creating, don't think about necessarily, oh, we're going to build this because it needs to do that. Like, even if it's not for your end, your end goal, sit down and just have a game. Like, how else could this be used? Let's, let's think about 20 other ways that people might use this thing that we're doing right now. First of all, it could come up with, I mean, the business likes that because like, oh my gosh, yeah, go make that too. Um, but but it would, you probably make better design decisions overall if you can think about the ways the thing you're making might be used in other applications that you don't have in mind today. Um, and you might come up with something really exciting, like, man, we're not going to build that because that's not in, in our swim lane. But what a, wouldn't it be cool if someone did that? And then you, people get more excited about the things they're building because they can envision yeah. sort of, you know, the thing that the people who made those those tracking devices and the video drives and other things that they weren't thinking about. But if you start thinking about that, you get more excited about building the thing that you're going to build. Uh, I would guess the security engineers would also love that because you will also find things like unintended uses where someone would be like, Oh, they could do this. Oh shoot, they sure could, right? Like, let's let's make sure that's prevented. So, I think that we do something kind of cool with. I think they're called in agile IP sprints. Is that is that right? IP sprints, where they kind of come together and and they do some things like that, like like creativity, right? Just kind of throw an idea out there, and maybe we'll never do it, but let's just try and be innovative. And I've seen some hackathons too, but cross product hackathons. And part of it is like, well, let me see if I can break it. And part of it might be like, well, how can I take this code and apply it to something else? And to your point, Jeff, it might be something where you're like, this is cool. We're never going to do anything with it. But you never know which this is cool moment you might have where that might actually be in your swim lane or be implementable or be an idea <laughs> you can hand off to someone else and prompt them. Be like, write this based on this. I'm, I'm a firm believer like I'm a firm believer that a lot of the greatest technology and, and non -tech, like just innovations happen because you're working on something else. Like, yeah, but wouldn't it be cool if we did this instead? It'd be like, what, let's do that. And like, that, that's got, right. I mean, very, I imagine, I'm sure there are people who are just, I, I know there are people who just sit around and come up with ideas and are just like inventor type people, but a lot of innovation doesn't come because someone's, you know, from carte blanche said, I'm going to create this. They're working on something else and they gave them an idea and they realized something even greater Right. I mean, that's what makes something patentable as, you know, like is, it's not just something new, but it has to be, you know, non-obvious and there has to be like an inventive step. And that inventive step is that moment of inspiration when you say, hey, I'm doing this thing. But like, what if instead yeah. somebody did that? Wait, what if we did that? That could actually change people's lives. And then, you know, yeah. I think it's powerful. And this might be completely an off topic thing, but, you, you know, whatever we are building, like you, you've got to care. You know, otherwise, like, you know, what is the point of, you know, the daily hustle? So, uh, you know, off topic, but I'm going to uh, uh, post this link if I if I can here. Um, so a couple of years back, this book um, uh, came out. It's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. This is Mark Manson. They actually made a docu documentary out of it, which is, you know, it's a, it's a nice watch. But what the person is saying is, like, not, you know, don't be the person who doesn't give an F, but, you know, choose the things that you you know care about you know so the you know most of the hustle that we're doing every day the things that cause us stress maybe they aren't the most important things so choose the things that you absolutely care about and put your heart and soul into it and then maybe you know it blossoms into something else like you were saying jeff so uh, it you know we, we have got to be able to you know step back from our daily grind and see what is this thing that we are building is there potential for this to be bigger than what we are what we envision it to, to be yeah, and I think too, it's, I, I always love to see um, uh, the the providential nature of like just moving through life. Uh, and so this example came up this week. I, over the last several months, I've been running uh, what I call a who is session at work once a month. And it's who is this other group that we work with that you don't know, right? Who is our talent acquisition team? Who is our research team? Like all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's informal. Uh, and we had a a BDR guy come on and he kind of ran through like top of the funnel or whatever, the first people that reach out to sell the product, whatever part of the funnel that is. And he was talking about that. And I was like, well, you're reaching out to engineers, right? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, why don't you, why don't I get some engineers together and you can like try out some of your outreach on us, right? And like test it out. And so we did a little bit of that. It wasn't as, as, a, as successful as I would have hoped, but it, it was something, right? 
Uh, this week, I got invited to a basically a working group that is exactly that, where this was happening in other parts of the organization where different BDR people were talking to like the head of learning or the head of talent or whatever. And they're like, let's run all of our messaging through there. Uh, and so now there's this working group that's like possibly changing how things work and, and how that messaging gets tested, right? Um, and it was all just because like, I, I didn't know what this group did over there. And so I was set up a, a quick 30 minute meeting with this group and had them come share like, tell me who you are, right? And then it just kind of led to those types of things. And you see that in software and process and all that other kind of stuff. Like if you're open to those opportunities, um, that's that's when they start to happen. Um, and if I would have just been like too busy, that would have never never happened. I wouldn't have been able to be involved in this this next effort either. Uh, can, can we just do that group? Can I just steal, steal, that, that, group? Can I steal uh, that from you? My, my lawyer in St. Louis trademarked it, so sorry. Uh, but not me, that's, right? I'm not your lawyer. Yeah. No, it's yeah, go for it. That was more of a I'm sorry, inside joke. Jeff is in addition to in addition to harassing him and trolling him about grammar, I try to find ways to trip him up and have him not admit that he is not my lawyer. Uh so far I'm O for infinity. He always answers with I'm not your lawyer. So. I will definitely always remind you that I am in fact not your lawyer. Um <laughs> that is that is true. Uh so I'm we're gonna seal that. And, That's fine. And Nicole, let's 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 do that. Let's have who is groups and like that would be i love that actually um they'd be beneficial for me too because i don't know what half the groups do either <laughs> i know what a lot of them do and, I mean, and, you know, and for a company like ours quite frankly it's not just that um for for a company like progress we we have um so many different tools and softwares and things that we acquire and things we build like i don't even know what half of our products do which is a terrible thing to say out loud but like we're a big company and i'm not involved with all of it so like it's also just be like hey what is this thing Hey, folks over here in this part of the company, did you know that we have this other thing? And like, do you even know what it does? Let's talk about it. Um, yeah, let's do that. Nate, I have to ask, what's what's BDR? Uh, business development something. Uh, sales uh, people. Yeah, rep. business Very development. Yeah. Yeah. So They're usually people folks. who cold call and handle mm. like lower level leads or and then pass them up yeah. to the people who close the deals. Yeah. Yeah. Those people are being yelled at by thing. random people on the telephone. Yeah. Is that what I do? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how much. Thing. Well, there is, there is some telephone stuff happening because that guy said like uh, a typical rep had 40 calls a week. And I was like, I'm out. I, I have not made 40 calls in the last four years. So do not make me get on the phone. Like that's, that's not me. I moved into sales once. I landed there for like less than two months, and I was like, "I'm I'm quitting now. I'm <laughs> I'm going to leave this company. I can't, can't." I mean, I, I'm effervescent, but you make me have a quota, and I will like run. <laughs> I mean, it's it really happens. Happens. my Go sister ahead. called last night, and I love her, and I was like, "I don't want to be on the phone." I I did. I answered, but like, I was just like, oh, an actual phone call. This couldn't have been done over text. So when we are talking about, you know, software that's, that's changing our lives, let, let, let's go around and maybe try to think of like, what is a recent piece of software or a hardware that you have used that you just went, wow, like this is, you know, truly impactful in the way I operate as a human being. Oh, you're putting us on the spot, Sam. Mm -hmm. I'm a terrible technologist. I don't use new technology. I, I like shun it all. Um, I can I can share one to give the others time to think. Uh, it, I don't know how new it is. Um, it's called it's called Hey Focus for OS X. Um, I don't use it nearly as much as I should, um, but it's a combination like Pomodoro timer and Focus, uh, like site blocker, app blocker, that kind of thing. And um, one of the things I'd found, I, I was using it as a developer where I would like start a Pomodoro and it would close down Outlook and Slack and just give me my code, and then I couldn't be interrupted until the Pomodoro ended and then it re restart those. Um, and I, do, I wasn't using it much as a people leader. And then I noticed one time that like most of my meetings that I was in, I actually wasn't in the actual meeting. Um, I was swiped over to doing something else, um, which isn't good, right? Like there's probably important things that I should be paying attention to. And so I started using it to like close down Slack. Uh, if I was going into an hour long meeting, I found I actually only needed to close Slack for about the first five minutes, maybe 10. And then I, I was just, I wouldn't use it again during that meeting. Um, and so I used it just to help focus more. Uh, and I should say too, um, that it only is a problem for me in, in non one-on-one -on -one meetings, like one-on-one -on -one, I can, I can focus and we can have that conversation. It's the like, Hey, here's a group of 30 people that we needed to get together to talk about this thing. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm 
one of the really important 30 people or if like the other 29 will cover anything that I miss. And so I ended up swiping over. So that's one that's been a positive change. I, I'm more I'm more focused and uh, uh, involved in those conversations now. I did a low tech version of that. I got myself a little uh, bicycle that goes under my desk and I have to like in meetings where or that are like that and I can leave my camera off. I bicycle, but I have to leave my camera off because otherwise I'm going like this. <laughs> People would be like, Nicole, you're really excited. I'd be like, no, my thighs burn. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, Kelvin, like, man, haven't we been trying to schedule a call for like a month and a half? He just posted that he's not a fan of calls. Like, we've been trying to get together on the phone, right? <laughs> um, you know, this is going to sound, I don't know, this is a, this is a different kind of tech. Not so Well, it is software. <clears throat> um, is so my my car um does a lot of like the autonomous driving type stuff it's not a tesla so it doesn't do like the i can't it doesn't do autonomous navigation i just say take me to this place and just drives but it does a lot of the there's a lot of like the safety stuff and it's interesting i don't do as many um long distance drives anymore um i have back issues and i have um hip issues and so staying in a car for a long time is kind of tough for me but also um you know when because I don't do them as often, I've started noticing because I'm always kind of wiggling around, moving around to kind of stretch because of the pain and stuff. And because like I'm all over the place, right? I mean, we had la our last episode was all about ADD, right? Like or ADHD, I'm all over. And so it's so easy for me to not even realize I'm being distracted by things when I am. It's actually made me more keenly aware. I don't generally just try to sit back and let the car do the driving, but I kind of let it do it. And I just sort of stay sort of half paying attention when I've started noticing. And it's made me, a, I think, a safer, better driver. I realize the things that, like, I didn't know I was doing that probably weren't safe. I never knew were happening in terms of like cutting things a little closer than I thought I was, and if we change lanes or like not paying attention to this or that, or and and I think that I'm like less of a hazard on the road because of it, but also like just more aware. It's it's, it's not about like the safety directly, but about the self awareness has allowed me to have about just the way I am when I'm on the road, and and it also notices like if you put it in even the simplest things, right? When you're in uh, like you know just like if you're in cruise, but it does the lane changing and the watching and slowing down with cars in front of you. But after a while, if you're not paying attention, like it starts bleeping at you and like get mad and like everything on the dash turns red, like you have stopped paying attention and you are not adequately holding onto the wheel anymore. It's like, oh, you're right. And I realized how often it's like, oh my God, that does happen. Um, and it's made me aware, which has been- yeah. No, no, that, this is a good point. Cause like, I mean, Nate was talking about like self-driving, uh, like this stuff, this is mainstream now. Almost every car manufacturer is doing it. And it is right. you know, so good. Cause like just, if you're just on a highway, you, you don't need, you know, every bit of attention. You, you can have a lot of aut autonomous help and it, it's really good now. So, you know, it, it helps out you know, big time. Um, I might be a little old school, like I, I'm, you know, there are so many, you know, newer, you know, avenues of human computer interaction, but like, I find like that these little like smartwatches are amazing because like the newer technologies are just, you know, helping us focus on the things that matter. I don't, you know, get to my phone as much nowadays, like GPS and, you know, turn by turn directions and being able to, you know, see where your kids are. Everything is just pretty much on my, on my wrist. I'm just a little bit less dependent on going to my computer, going to, or, you know, grabbing my phone, um, and, and battery lives are increasing. Uh, so it, it just you know, changes how I, you know, function every day as a human. Can, can I just take a moment and point out like where we are as a society, where as people that like Sam considers the fact, like his smartwatch is what makes him old school. Like the fact that his, his, the thing that he thinks is cool tech, but he knows his old fashioned as a smartwatch. It is old fashioned, but it's the yeah. supercomputer he wears on his wrist like he's James Bond. That is the old school thing that he likes. I, I've I never owned a smartwatch day. because like too many things buzz on me all the time already. Like I don't need more notifications. I don't own one. I also don't own like Alexa or any like like always on devices in my house. I'm really I am old school. Like I don't want any of that stuff. You, you're much. waking up you're waking up my device by saying that name. <laughs> can't can't say I'm I'm very sorry. Um <laughs> right. Uh yeah, I don't, I, I, it's, it's too much stimulation for me all the time. Too much stuff. My I need like isolation. If someone is like a good, like I can be productive and do my job while sitting in like an isolation chamber, that would be tech that would change my life. <laughs> that would be wonderful. I think that, um, for, for me, well, first I want to say when it comes to like, like doing things that are old, I, my call earlier this morning, we brought up Cher and I was dr singing gypsies, tramps and thieves 
So that was like, I think that was before I was born, but I was still rocking. Even older than smartwatches, Nicole. <laughs> Even older than smartwatches. <laughs> but um, something that's been really changing. So um, I, I do some writing on the side and we were talking about e-readers and they're improving the voices and the intonation of e-readers. And what that's allowed people to do in indie publishing is, you know, if you're trying to get a, um, a book read for Audible or something like that, it can cost five to 10 cents a word. And when you have an 80,000 word novel, that's pretty expensive. And the indie author can't always uh, uh, pay that in advance. And so they can't keep up with the market. Right. But when you use these e-readers that are starting to have better intonation and, and, and better, you know, smoothness of voice, let's say, um, it helps those people enter into that market. But, you know, it's it, everything has pluses and minuses. Right. So then like the poor voice actors, you know, you know, so so everything has kind of like a, a plus and a minus to it. Yeah. You know, Kelly, my son has. I've never even considered changing like the voice or the information of like Siri. It's the first thing he did when he got an iPhone is like, I don't like the native, the, the default Siri voice. And so he found one that resonated with him. And it's really interesting. Just the idea of not only having better intonation, but like improving and having more options, not only in multi-language, but different dialects, different sounds that like, so that you can find a voice that, that, that works for you is kind of interesting. Yeah. Mine is Australian male and has been since the day I was able to do it. He uses Australian male some of the time. Um, he likes that one. I, it's, it's interesting. Maybe not for the same reason. As, I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say that, Jeff. Don't, don't shush, shush. Um, so, I'm going to try and get us back. Away from <laughs> this, Jeff. Uh, um, away from Australians. Yeah. Away, away from, yeah. Uh, I, you can, I, I've, I've known Jeff for a while, so not, not super close, but I feel like sometimes we all have to take turns and, and reel us back in. Oh, but going back to Sam's smartwatch, I, I haven't worn a smart smartwatch, but I had a Fitbit that I wore um, mostly just because I was starting to walk and I didn't believe that my phone was actually tracking the number of steps. But one of the things I found was interesting was when I had my Fitbit um, last year, uh, I think it was August, <clears throat> I got I got COVID and um, spent the week in quarantine. And I was just like, uh, the next week I was looking at things on my phone and I was just like bored and I opened up the Fitbit app and my heart, uh, my resting heart rate was like three to five beats higher during the week that I had COVID. And I was like, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? Your body's fighting an infection. Your resting heart rate's going to be higher. And then I was like, huh, that's really cool. Like I, I basically was asymptomatic for the most part. My, my wife had symptoms and then I tested and was positive. And so like, but my resting heart rate went up. And so like, there's an uh, opportunity, right? To be like, we don't know that you have an infection. But something has changed in the last week where your heart rate is, you know, three beats higher than it normally is. Maybe get a test, right? And so it's just those kind of things where you start, you know, that wasn't why Fitbit put a heart rate monitor in there, but it just was an interesting piece of data. Yeah. It, it is amazing what they can pull off. You know, it can track your sleep. Like I sleep really bad. Like it'll tell you where you're, you're, you might have like a sleep apnea. Uh, if you have a fall, you can be alerted and you can, it can actually call like 911 if you, if you really need help. It, if you're going hiking into a place which doesn't have any cell reception, it can do GPS. So you can, you know, track your way back. Uh, it can do blood oxygen level, like, you know, ECG. Everything is just, you know, packed into a supercomputer, like yeah. you know, Jeff was saying that we just strap onto our wrist. Blood oxygen level, it can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. it is amazing. It is kind of amazing, and it and it's interesting, right? Because it's not even necessarily about the fitness side. Like if you wear it every day, it knows. Like, is, it alerts you to other things, right? Not just oh, I have an infection. You already knew you had COVID, but it could be a simple thing like oh, you're developing some sort of coronary or like a, like a heart disease thing you don't know about. At, at I mean, we're old people, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know, Nate, Nate, you're even older than I am. I think I'm the oldest on the call. Probably. You are the oldest on the call because I'm normally yeah. the oldest on the call. I think, and I know you're older than me. I am. Um, older than you. And right, it's just little things like, huh? It just seems like not anything that you would even notice a change like physically every day, yeah. but like, but it does, right? The technology notices and it triggers you to check it out. So I'm struggling so hard, so I'm going to say it anyway because I'm struggling so hard to bite my tongue. I so want to bring socioeconomics into this. Because, okay. you know, I just know, like, all of these great things are all advantages that people can take care of. But if I'm in a lower uh, earnings bracket, I can't afford a car that has safety features. I can't afford a Fitbit. I can't afford an Apple Watch. 
So when we're talking about these medical things that can be tracked, like they're at a they're at a disadvantage because this software is improving things for other people, but but they're so <laughs> sorry, it's totally off topic, but I just No, no, it's No, it's actually not off topic, especially for our show in general, right? I think it's a good point. Um and I do think a lot of those technological changes come eventually and they become more affordable over time, but it's like, right, whatever is the hippest, coolest, newest thing, certainly, I mean, it tends to be expensive. There's the R&D that goes into it, so it costs a lot of money. And then, uh, plus there's just the, the fact that it's new and cool, so companies know they can charge more money for it and people will find a way to pretend they have discretionary income they don't really have and buy things they shouldn't buy. Um, yeah, no, there is. And, and, and now, something that's interesting is it's not always, um, I think there are ways that a lot of that technology can be made accessible and affordable to people that we don't necessarily always see in certain parts of the world, like like here in the States. Um, there's a, I am going to have a reason to bring up KCDC. Yes. So there's a, <laughs> yes. So there's a, there's a speaker um, coming this year who, um, he works for a, a firm in South Africa. He works together with a guy who, um, I don't think Nate and Sam, neither of you were here last year for it, right? But uh, there's a guy got to got to be a guy named Michael Dara, who's a consultant based in Zimbabwe, and he came and spoke here at KCDC last year. He's coming in this year with his colleague from South Africa, and they're going to be talking. Um, oh no, no, Nicole, it's never over. It is never over. Like, I was just yeah. typing that in the chat. Like it's never over. It just like the day of the last day of KCDC, they tell you the dates for next year's KCDC. And then the people like me will DM the organizers and be like, when's the CFP open before I even leave the convention center? So yeah, it's actually- That is a fact. It is actually never over. It, 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 so, so no, no, but, but the point, this is a point to this. So um, this time, so, um, so the speaker is coming uh, to speak about uh, fintech and mobile tech and innovation in the African tech scene. Um, and, and because a lot of time, and I have a friend who's not in technology, just a friend of mine I've known for a long time in, in England who is in microfinance and spends a lot of time in smaller villages, not in the big cities in Africa, but smaller smaller villages and historically maybe tribal villages or in various parts of Africa where, where he talks about access to capital and access you know, to resources. and. So there are things happening with mobile technology, maybe not on iPhones, but things in Android and other things that 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 in other parts of the world um, are available and accessible. We just don't always do a good job of making them accessible to people who can't afford like the big shiny fancy thing here in the states, and we should do a better job of that. Um, and we don't. There was a there was a really good talk at Nebraska JS. Uh, I don't know four or five years ago, um, and it, and the gist of it was how many people in the world have. 3G data and how you doing uh, NPM install star dot star basically is screwing over all of them because now when they go to your app, it takes way too long to download and they're like, do you really need every single function that Lodash has? Probably not. You're probably using three, right? Um, and and you, you installed Moment for this one time that you're formatting the date. Why don't you just, you know, write some code yourself to do that kind of thing? Uh, and not to not to pick on those packages because well moment might be obsolete or uh, deprecated now but anyway like the point was like you're you're bringing a giant package to do like one or two things and then when your users go to use your app they have to go download that package uh, which is consuming their data and you're like all they're trying to do is this one thing and they've got to wait an additional you know thirty seconds uh, which doesn't seem like long until you're sitting on your phone going why is this page not reloading. Um, and so he, the, the speaker was like kind of challenging us or charging us to like, think about what you're building, uh, and, and how yeah. you build it. And then that can help have an impact on some of these things. Right. Yeah. So something comes to mind and it may not be the you know best thing to, you know, say out loud, but, you know, to Nicole's point. So a lot of things that take a lot of, you know, research and, and, and they're shiny and they're expensive, <clears throat> you know, start with, but that it trickles down and becomes, you know, more cost effective as, as we do more and more, like, you know, little things like, you know, rear view cameras in our cars, this used to be, you know, shiny thing, you know, 15 years back. Now it's mandated by, you know, the FAA for every car. Uh, to, to have it. So things become cheaper as we go. And also like this attitude that we get into that we have to have the shiniest and the newest thing all the time. Uh, most modern tech, most modern hardware, things last forever, right? So if you, you know, walk into a store, you, I mean, you can get, you know, things that are used and maybe certified by, 
you know, they're, you know, um, you know, they're, they're tech people, and then they are at a much, much lower, you know, price point. And maybe some of the tech that's, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the most expensive thing now has like a 10, 15 year life. And then, you know, as it changes hands, it you know, gets cheaper and cheaper. And these things last forever, like iPhones or Android phones, modern phones will last forever. And they will, you know, change hands and become more accessible to people at maybe at a, a lower price point. Is that really true? Is, is that really? Yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like there's planned obsolescence in a lot of these things, though. Yes. Not, right. Like saying saying they will last forever. The the technology itself maybe will, although in a lot of respects, I feel like like even now this is off topic from things like phones, but even things like large appliances, right? Like, did my in laws have a refrigerator that's like sixty years old and it works just fine in their basement? You can't buy a fridge that lasts more than eight anymore. It costs five times more than any fridge ever in history. And it'll still be dead in eight years because something goes wrong and the cost of repairing it. Can it be repaired? Yes. The cost of repairing it costs more than just buying a whole nother fridge. And same thing, like the battery life on this iPhone, like it's not gonna it, it, you know, like the battery and I know you can replace this over time, but even the hardware, what ends up happening is um, like with things like a phone. Will the phone last forever? Yes. If you need to update your apps, eventually it'll be like, oh, you can't use this app anymore unless you update it. So you go, oh, I'll update the app. It's like, oh, you can't update the app unless you update the iOS first. Okay, let's update iOS. So it turns out that the hardware and the memory and the processor that's in this old phone can't actually effectively run the new iOS, which requires a whole lot more juice. And so like now I can't update the iOS, so I can't update the app, so I can't even use the apps. So does the hardware survive? Yes. Can I use it? No. That, that that exact thing yeah. happened to me with with my laptop. First, the battery went. I'm like, okay, I'll leave it plugged in all the time. And then the same thing, like like install, install new new OS, new OS. And then it was just like, nope, your hardware's not compatible. And then I couldn't get any antivirus security software on it. So then I was like, okay, I'll not use it for the internet. I'll only use it for um, illustration. And then the company was like, you can't use our computers for personal stuff anymore. I was like, well, goddamn it, now I have to buy a new laptop. <laughs> No, no, there, there's definitely truth to what you're saying. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to point out that this, you know, attitude that we have, like every year we need to go and buy shiny new things to be happy and to stay on the cutting edge. I mean, may, maybe it has a little bit more life than what we give it sometimes. I agree with that. But I also think that you're thinking of it from a very middle class point of view and not a very lower class point of view, right? Because I just put it, I bought a flip phone. I had to buy a flip phone and it was over a hundred bucks. Do you know how many hours on minimum wage you have to work to earn a hundred dollars after taxes and that's imagining that you don't need it for food or rent or what have you so you know you, that's that's the thing is like it, is it are we ever going to be able to completely accommodate people who are really in the lower echelons i don't know i just don't i don't know but i think that when we think about um things like this we're still thinking from a very middle class solid middle class instead of like a lower middle class point of view. Um, so by the time the middle class, lower middle class might be able to afford that thing, the, I, the, the OS isn't going to work anymore, you know? Yeah. And I think scheduled obsolescence should die. A, a very quick death. I, right, I had to buy a bunch of new appliances. They all died within a week of each other exactly after the warranty expired. And I am not lying. The, the warranty was five years. Five years and a week later, staggered Within a month, they all broke, all of them. Wow. wow. Okay, I, I do have a question for Nate here. Uh, again, <laughs> pertaining to what you said up front, which uh, caught me off guard. You had seventeen plural site courses, which is a lot. And wow. given how much you know effort it takes to produce one, so kudos to you. But I wanted to ask you, like from your work perspective, you know, Pluralsight has so much of amazing content, and so how do you folks think about? democratizing that learning part of it, making it more accessible to more and more people. Uh, do you folks think about, you know, how developers learn differently? How do you cater to, you know, each one? Yeah, um, I mean, the short answer is yes. And the longer answer is um, those usually aren't my teams. Uh, so I don't have a ton of insight. Uh, so um, up until um, the end of the year last year, my, my teams were focusing on um, uh, the, the software that connects the authoring community to us. Um, and then um, going forward later this year, I'm going to be, um, or here in a couple of months, I'll be taking on a team that is um, focusing more on some of the content, uh, new content types, I guess. Um, so there, there are folks that look at that, right? Um, we have video courses and, and um, uh, 
uh, hands-on material. So you can, you can say, we're going to do a, um, we're going to do, uh, I was going to say something about cloud, but I don't know anything about cloud. That's not entirely true. I am not a cloud developer. I know about it, but I've not been like, I've not stood up cloud apps. So let me say something more like, uh, we're going to build some react node react app. We can actually have a, a, a sandbox uh, that that is set up and kind of pre-configured and then the learner can go and experiment or um, even um, uh, do some code and then like kind of run tests to make sure that it it actually does what it's supposed to do um, and we have other things like um, we have assessments that you know kind of help evaluate like did you learn the things that we that you thought you did um, and then we even have some um, well, what do they call it? Uh, virtual instructor-led training. So it would be instructor-led, except for like on Zoom or on Teams or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Kind of the old school, like go to a class type of thing. Um, and so there, and then there's there's teams that that's their whole job is to be like, what what should we be doing next? What kind of learning can we help with? Um, and then we have other teams that I have heard of um, that I haven't talked to, but um, since I mentioned who is, now I'm thinking maybe I need to go put them in one of my future who is sessions uh, that do reach out to. Um, uh, you know, lower, um, uh, lower income or, or lower, um, the CEO had a great quote years ago. It was talents everywhere, but opportunity isn't right. Talents equal. Everyone has talent in every place, but not everyone has the opportunity. And so they're trying to provide opportunities for some of those places that have talent that maybe don't have the opportunity. Um, and so there's teams that they're looking at, like, can we work with, um, you know, these coding nonprofits or boot camps or um, other countries, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, that's that's about as much as I can say, because I like I said, I'm not in it. Yeah, that, that's more of the uh, the PR yeah. comments I've heard since I've been there the last couple of years. No, that, that's well, yeah. I mean, like what Nicole was saying, like everybody learns differently. So you're, you're yeah. thinking about it. And, and I love the fact that you have like, you know, sometimes you will have like a whole um, a build up to learn certain thing. Like it's it's like a course where. That's a combination of multiple things. Uh, maybe some, you know, instructor led, some videos, some, yeah. you know, hands on labs. That that's great. It's like the learning path thing or whatever, right? The learning like, path, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually learning my HTML and my CSS on Pluralsight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's if you I mean, get to uh, CSS animations in that path, that's my course. Oh, so, nice. I'll get to see you without you having to see me. Well, you won't get to see me because it's I won't be on video, but you'll get to you'll get to hear me, uh, which has actually uh, I've I've had someone turn around once and be like, "Do you have the course on GoLang?" And I'm like, "No, I have a course on Elixir." And they're like, "Oh, that's what it was. I recognized your voice." And I was like, "That's an interesting experience." Uh, and then I immediately texted Jeff about it. I don't know if he remembers that or not. But... I do remember that. Do you know that has has John ever told John Mills ever told you the story about like when he was at a Sporting KC match and like someone recognized him from his JavaScript videos, like from his voice sitting behind him and like said to, I think it was to Nathan, one of, or, or to Luke, one of his boys like, your dad's like a really big deal. Did you know that or something crazy <laughs> like that? <laughs> I learned a lot from him. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, I know we're about out of time, but like the, and, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to totally turn this into like a big plural site plug necessarily, but, but there is kind of bringing it full circle to the whole idea of, of tech changing lives. There's a lot of opportunity for organizations like Pluralsight to do just that by not only providing just the learning content of like, here's how you do this thing, but also to the point you were saying earlier that we were all talking about of, of thinking about different ways and ideating on ways that tech can be used in different, like you have some really smart people in your author community who come in and who can think about this, th those things and build courses showing people new ways to think about the tech they're using every day. Not just like, here's how you use this, but have you considered you could also do that with this? And like, now I don't know whether those are profitable courses or not, but they're interesting and they can be innovative and they can be life-changing for a lot of people. Um, yeah, and so to, to tie it back to, I guess, where we were starting and, and, and there's the technology part and there's kind of the process part of like being human. Um, one of the things that I like to do is we have a we have a channel uh, that shows our um, various customer feedback um, and it just kind of streams throughout the day. Uh, uh, and so I'll go in there because it's it's everything, right? It's um, sometimes people are like, I already knew all of this because they're talking about a specific course, but whatever. I like to go in and find the ones that either are in a, uh, a non-English language because that's kind of cool to me to see like, hey, look, we have users that aren't us. Um, and I'll share those, um, and then I'll I'll usually put it into Google Translate, and then I'll ask like the team, like, hey, who wants to take a guess? And it's it's cool because we we're a big enough company. We have people who are like, oh, I spent two years in Brazil. That's Portuguese, and it means this. And you're like, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. 
Um, and then the others that are just like, um, you know, sometimes you'll get a comment like this course gave me my first job or whatever, right? And it's those kind of cool things to share with the engineers and the product people that are day-to-day, -day, you know, fixing security vulnerabilities or pulling their hair out because the build pipeline's broken and they can't figure it out. And then, you know, hopefully when they see this comment that's like, this helped me get my first course, like, or first job rather, then that can be a, a little bit of, um, you know, a little dopamine hit of just like, oh, I am somehow contributing to this person getting a job. Like that's, that's a pretty cool feeling, right? And so it doesn't have to be, um, you know, you wrote the video player for for our company, but it could just be like, oh yeah, I, I'm on whatever team and my team, if they don't exist, then this person doesn't watch the course and then that person doesn't get the job and they can't change their family tree and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it's just cool to share those kind of things as you see them, as you come across them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We can keep talking about this stuff for a long time, but we are almost at time here. So uh, Nate, since you started off, maybe you leave us with, you know, parting thoughts, like we have had, quite a journey in tech and, uh, you know, software is changing lives. What are you looking forward to in the next, you know, coming years? Um, so, <laughs> so this could be a whole other, um, I don't know if it's this podcast or not, but a whole other podcast where uh, my career philosophy, um, oh no, did I freeze? Yeah, I froze your camera. Okay, okay, I'm back. A second. No, you're back. Um, so, so my my um, my career philosophy has I've described as a lazy river. Um, so when you go to the water parks, right, you get on the, the inner tube and you just kind of float, and then you find places that you like to hang out. That's how I've done the entire career. I'm just like, oh, I, other than software. So I'm just kind of like, oh, what, this this might be fun. Let me go to a company that only writes software and they don't have a tangible product. Um, and then let me go and try being a sales engineer while also a software engineer. I'm like, yeah, I kind of like that, but not as much as this. Um, and so I'm not a five-year plan type of person. I don't have goals and checklists and things like that. Um, so I guess in terms of what I'm looking forward to in, in the next couple of years is, is just more of that, right? Like what, what are those opportunities that are going to come up that, um, by me just being around and talking to other people present themselves and I'll like learn, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's really cool. Like, let's find a way to integrate that. Um, and then also, um, I'm finding over the last couple of years that I, I really enjoy watching uh, my engineers succeed. So finding ways that they can succeed. And, and I always tell them, um, my, one of my goals is to help them succeed in whatever definition of success is to them. Like, I'm not going to tell you what success is, right? Um, uh, if you're, if you love the back end, it would be foolish of me to tell you, you really need to learn react because that's boring to you. Right. So you tell me what you want to do and I will help you as much as I can do that. Um, and so I think that's where I'm going to spend some time is just trying to help people be successful in, in their goals and dreams. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, I don't think we can top it with anything else. So we're going to call it a show uh, here. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, and uh, Nate, most importantly, thanks for giving us an hour of your uh, day. This has yeah. been a great conversation. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Aztec is hanging out. So, yeah, um, hopefully um, you're going to see um, uh, some of us at Jeff's conference coming up, at Nate's conference coming up. So thanks for getting us together. And, uh, yeah, be good, everyone. Stay productive and uh, be happy. And we'll see you on the next show. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.